Welcome to another episode of Crime Scene X. In today's episode, we will be covering four disturbing and true police horror stories. Sit back and enjoy. I thought I'd seen it all in my 20 years on the force. I've been through crime scenes that would make most people lose their lunch, and I thought I was hardened to it all. But nothing could have prepared me for that night. It started with a call to a remote house on the edge of town. A neighbor had heard strange noises and suspected illegal activities. My partner Mike and I had been on countless similar calls, and we figured it was nothing more than a false alarm. When we arrived at the house, the lights were off, but the front door was slightly ajar. We announced ourselves, but there was no response. Something about the place sent a shiver down my spine. We entered, guns drawn, and the smell hit us almost immediately. It was a mixture of rotting food, body odor, and something metallic that I couldn't quite place. We cleared the living room and kitchen before making our way down the dark hallway, the smell growing stronger with each step. The master bedroom's door was closed. We could hear a faint, wet sound coming from inside, like something being cut or sliced. Mike and I exchanged a worried glance before I kicked in the door. The scene inside was like something out of a horror movie. A man, covered in blood and filth, hunched over a body on the floor. Around him were knives, saws, and other tools, all stained with fresh blood. He looked up at us, his eyes wild and vacant, his face twisted in a sick smile. There was no recognition, no understanding in his gaze. He was beyond reason. We shouted at him to drop the knife, but he only laughed, a high-pitched crazed sound that sent chills down my spine. Mike and I were both seasoned officers, but this was different. This was madness. We were able to subdue him eventually, but not before he lunged at Mike, slashing his arm. The man was strong, fueled by whatever insanity had taken him. The victim on the floor was dead, her body mutilated in ways I still can't comprehend. The subsequent investigation revealed that the man was her husband. He had a history of mental illness, and something had finally snapped. The case was clear-cut, but the images from that night stayed with me. I couldn't shake the look in that man's eyes, the sheer absence of humanity. I took some time off, but even now, years later, I still see his face in my nightmares. We like to think that we can understand people, that we can predict how they'll act. But that night taught me that there are depths to the human mind that are beyond our comprehension. Depths that can turn a loving husband into a monster. The world is full of horrors, not hidden in the shadows, but in plain sight, behind the doors of ordinary houses and in the minds of ordinary people. It's a lesson I learned all too well, and one I'll never forget. My first year as a police officer in the small town of Harrowsgate had been relatively uneventful. The town was quiet, nestled deep in the woods, and the most serious crimes were petty thefts and occasional drunken brawls. That all changed on the night of October 5th. The call came in just after midnight, a disturbance at an old abandoned house on the edge of town. It was my partner, Officer Daniels, and me on the late shift, so we responded. I remember feeling a chill as we drove to the scene, the moon a pale sliver in the cloudy sky. As we pulled up, the house loomed in the darkness, the wind howling through the broken windows. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as we cautiously approached the front door, flashlights sweeping the darkness. We entered the house and were immediately hit with the smell of decay. The walls were covered in graffiti, the floors creaked, and the whole place felt wrong. My instincts were screaming at me to get out, but we had a job to do. The disturbance had come from the basement, so we headed down the creaky stairs, our flashlights casting eerie shadows on the walls. As we reached the bottom, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There, in the center of the basement, was a makeshift table, surrounded by candles and strange symbols, and on that table lay the remains of what had once been a human being. I won't describe what we found in detail, but it was clear that something unspeakably brutal had happened there. Daniels and I backed out of the basement, both of us shaken to the core. We called in backup and secured the scene. The investigation that followed revealed a twisted story of a local cult involved in human sacrifices. The abandoned house had been their place of rituals, and the victim was a young girl who had gone missing a few weeks earlier. The horror of that night stayed with me for a long time. And even though we were able to arrest the members of the cult and bring them to justice, the images of that basement never left me. Sometimes, when I'm out on patrol, 
I'll drive past that old house, and I can still feel the chill in the air, hear the creak of the floorboards, and see the shadows on the wall. What I saw that night taught me that the darkness in the human soul can be more terrifying than any ghost or supernatural force. It was a lesson I'll never forget, and a reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places. I'll never forget the call that changed everything for me. After 10 years on the force, I thought I was numb to the horrors that people can inflict on one another. But that night proved me wrong. It was a quiet evening when the call came in. A neighbor had reported strange noises coming from the house next door. My partner, Officer Davis, and I were assigned to investigate. Upon arrival, we were greeted by an ordinary suburban home. It was a place where you'd expect to find a family with kids and a dog, not something that would lead to the most disturbing case of my career. We knocked, announcing ourselves as police officers, but received no response. The house was eerily silent except for a faint sound, like muffled crying. After a few moments of consideration, we decided to enter, fearing that someone might be in trouble. Inside, everything looked typical until we reached the basement door. The crying was louder now, and a sick feeling settled in my stomach. Something was very wrong. The door was locked, but we managed to force it open. The smell hit us first, a mix of bleach and something rotting. My flashlight illuminated the room, revealing a scene that still haunts my dreams. There, in a cage, was a young woman, disheveled and terrified. Her eyes met mine, filled with a horror that words can't describe. The room was filled with photographs, surgical instruments, and notes that detailed an unspeakable torment. We called for backup, and within minutes the house was swarming with officers. As they took the young woman to safety, we explored the rest of the basement. What we discovered was a methodical record of terror. This was no random act of violence. It was a planned, deliberate campaign of psychological torture. The man living in that house had been stalking the young woman for months. He'd photographed her, documented her routines, and finally abducted her. His notes described the pleasure he took in breaking her, both physically and mentally. We later found out he had done this before. Not many times, but enough to show a pattern of behavior that was escalating. We'd stopped him, but the damage was already done. The trial was quick, and he was sentenced to life in prison. But the memory of that night, of that basement, and of the look in that young woman's eyes, it never left me. The rain was relentless that night, as if trying to wash away the filth and decay of the city. I was nearing the end of my shift, tired and ready for a long night's sleep. But the call came in, and duty called. A disturbance at an apartment complex. A sound of struggle, cries for help. Routine, I thought as I headed over, but something twisted in my gut, a premonition that gnawed at my mind. Upon arriving at the scene, the building loomed over me, dark and silent except for the rain's steady rhythm. An old lady from the building met me at the entrance, her eyes wide and her voice trembling as she described the terrible sounds coming from apartment 406. I thanked her and made my way up the stairs, each step creaking ominously, the smell of old wood and damp filling the air. As I approached the door to 406, I heard it, a faint whimper, a muffled cry. My heart pounded in my chest as I knocked on the door. Police, open up, I called, but there was no response. The crying continued, growing more desperate. I forced the door open, and a rush of cold air met me. The apartment was dark, the only light coming from a flickering bulb in the kitchen. The crying was louder now, and I followed it, my hand on my gun, my senses on edge. In the bedroom I found her, a young girl, no more than six or seven, tied to a chair, her eyes wide with terror, her body bruised and battered. I hurried to free her, my mind racing, my hands trembling. The room was filled with photographs, drawings, and letters, all focused on the little girl. Obsession, possession, madness. It was all there laid bare in a chilling display. She was too traumatized to speak, so I called for backup and did my best to comfort her. As I looked around the room, I realized that the person responsible had been watching her for a long time, stalking her, learning everything about her. The ensuing investigation led us to a neighbor in the same building, a man who seemed ordinary, friendly even. But behind his facade lay a mind twisted by delusion and obsession. He'd convinced himself that the girl was his daughter, 
taken from him by unseen forces. His walls were covered in deranged writings, his mind lost in a maze of insanity. The trial was a media circus, the city horrified and fascinated by the twisted mind behind the crime. But for me, the terror was personal, intimate, 